Hello, everyone. Welcome back to A Dancer's Mindset with myself, Isabella. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be speaking with a very special guest, Hannah Martin. Now, Hannah was originally a rhythmic gymnast. A big moment for her was when she represented England when she was 15 in 2018 at the Commonwealth Games in Australia, getting to the finals with her rhythmic ball routine. But at some stage in her life, Hannah decided that she wanted to do ballet. So starting ballet late, she had to work extra hard to achieve her dream. Fast forward, and she achieved that by going to Birmingham Royal Ballet and getting a contract there as an artist. So she is now living the dream as a full-time ballerina, having achieved so much already as a rhythmic gymnast. So I could think of someone no better than Hannah for inspiring and motivating you all today. So let's speak with Hannah. Hello, Hannah. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast with me. Um, I'm so excited to have you here today. And I know a lot of my listeners are just going to be, well, actually, I think a lot of my listeners actually follow you as well um because you have a sort of similar vibe just um well you're very inspiring yourself people have said i'm inspiring but i think you're very inspiring as well oh my goodness um, isabella you're on another level like you've inspired <laughs> me since i was i was tiny <laughs> no you're too sweet um no but um just i obviously for the podcast i've been doing a lot of research on you and um yeah it's very inspirational and I've always thought that um going back how you know you've done so much in such a really a short space of time and um I won't go into it too much now because I want to hear the whole story but I want to go back a little bit first of all um to the beginning of your journey even in um, gymnastics because you know like many ballerinas a lot of ballerinas start with gymnastics but you actually pursued this as a career you know early on to a very extreme high level and um with your gymnastics were you naturally gifted towards it um or did you have to work towards the skills required such as the extreme flexibility yeah um great question i was naturally very flexible so i actually started when i was six in artistic gymnastics which mm -hmm. is the flips and the somersaults, which everyone thinks is what I did, but it, it wasn't. I always I still have it with the physios at work now. They're like, oh, you know, you're really strong from all that, like flipping. I'm like, I've never done a backflip in my entire life. Like rhythmic <laughs> gymnastics was all about the flexibility element, as you were saying. So as I did artistic gymnastics, um, I found I couldn't do the flips and the strong power moves because I would just bend in half. like. You know we do like a backflip but instead of flipping what well, I would just bend um yeah. so uh, my mum took me to her friend's rhythmic gymnastics club like they had been teammates when they they were younger and then one of them had gone and created their own club called iStar and I always remember my mum took me to the gymnastics um place and I fell in love I think with rhythmic gymnastics at that point I was like wow like this is a, a place that embraces my flexibility rather than like kind of pushes it away. So mm. I think that, that was something that was quite exciting for me because it was uh, finally, I felt like I was, like you say, like apt at something. Uh, whereas artistic, I would work really hard, but I just wasn't naturally gifted in that area. Yeah. Um, I went, but it wasn't like a, you know, sail right to the top moment. Um, again, the flexibility was actually a bit of an issue. Uh, because I didn't have any strength to surround that. So as a young young athlete, I would be able to hit the positions, but not hold the positions, which caused a lot of deductions in the in with the gymnastics. So my first few competitions, I was just coming last. And also the apparatus never really used it before. And a lot of kids, you know, um, start at the age of like three. So they're quite apt with all the, the apparatus. I, I didn't know how to do anything. I was just like, oh, I can hit my my nose and my foot together but that's that's about it so um yeah. last a lot of my first competitions I was what some judges thought pretty hopeless um mm. 
I actually had some judges who were just like, you should just give up. Um, but, really? you know. What would you say, yeah. what would you say the hardest thing about um, gymnastics training is? Ooh, um, especially when it gets up to the elite level, just the the amount of hours. And I think physically it was, like physically and mentally it was challenging. Mm. Uh, I think just the demands of that, like the constant yeah. competition. Um, also here in the UK, there there was a lack of funding. So I think that financial pressure, not just for myself, but for my family was really difficult on an already difficult sport. So mm -hmm. having that extra pressure um, just kind of made things on a magnitude level of stress that was, I wouldn't say very healthy for me as an individual. Um, but also just, yeah, I think the some of the things physically, um, probably now I look back, I was like, oh man, I can't believe I used to do that. My body has it like <laughs> keep itself together. <laughs> so I think because <laughs> obviously that's you, say... why you see such low retirement rates. Um, right. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. Olympic I champions retiring at like 18, 19. That's like the, you know. Yeah, of course. Um, you say you had to work on your um, flexibility you had some flexibility obviously because you were attracted to rhythmic but obviously unlike ballet and we'll talk about this later because I sort of feel like when we get to that conversation you almost have to tone it down slightly for you <laughs> just because you're so flexible but like I'm very interested myself because I'm not a gymnast by any means so even though in ballet terms like i'm pretty flexible the rhythmic gymnastic terms like that's on another level so i'm interested to hear what does it take you know um how do you achieve that amount of flexibility in order to and i wouldn't say it's healthy either hence why people retire early but what does it take you know how do you have to do these crazy stretches do you have to hold them for so long tell us a bit about that yeah I know that a lot of uh I know a lot of my my uh other athletes that I was working with did have coaches that would really stretch them a lot um thankfully like my coaches never really believed in that for me as an individual because I was quite naturally flexible the way we did work my flexibility because there were certain areas that still like my hamstrings is something that has really improved I've actually been coaching another girl on some hamstring flexibility recently and I was like wow I can't actually believe how you sometimes forget like how far you've come with something and I was like wow I remember when I was younger I could hardly you know quite touch my nose to my knees and now I'm like the hamstrings are my favorite thing to stretch I love stretching my hamstrings so yeah. I think um with mine it's always been about gradual and just working where you're out about consistency so just doing it consistently day in day out and not worrying too much about overstretching as soon as someone did an overstretch with me as soon as a coach laid their hands on me and tried to pull me yeah I would get injured so yeah. they my coach just knew that wasn't what would work for me although I did see other gymnasts doing that and it was perhaps working for them um also I think the repetition of extreme like flexibility for example in our routines we would have you know crazy flexibility stuff going on like madness and um we'd be doing that those routines what we do four repetitions of each routine and we had four operators so we'd be doing that 16 times 16 times to 20 times yeah. every single day on top of the stretching and the conditioning that we're already doing for our bodies which contained lots of hypermobility stretches yeah. so i think just the amount of like hypermobility stuff you were doing i think it mm. would just yeah it was yeah. just part of the daily in and out but for me consistency has always been key so. no I completely agree with that actually because um even just for myself which is nowhere near as flexible as you I would say you know people always say oh you know what stretches do you do you know how do you get so flexible what you know expecting me to say you know crazy stretches yeah and actually it was like pretty basic stuff it was just like literally consistency and I, I had for me I held the stretches a long time to allow stuff to really lengthen yeah. you know but it was literally very 
quite simple stuff the most extreme was like over splits and like yes, some same, same. needles and things but nothing yeah. you know mental I feel like a lot of people like they approach me with that question of like oh there must be some sort of stretch that's gonna like unlock everything and I'm like <laughs> no it's just basically the same stretches and you just have to do them every day and just consistently yeah. hold them for a good amount of time where your body feels good don't push yourself because I always hear like I was like oh I really pushed myself and now I've injured myself and I can't mm -hmm. stretch for eight weeks and it's like mm -hmm. you're actually setting yourself back if you like yeah of course try and push it too far like yeah. there's a certain amount I always say to girls like like push yourself an extra five percent mm -hmm. to where it feels like slightly uncomfortable yeah don't push yourself to like 300 percent where no. it's like excruciating because then you're going to just hurt yourself so it's like it's finding it again with life as I'm learning myself at this current time it's all about balance so even with stretching it's the same yeah it makes me laugh actually because um when I was uh 13 I actually I was very stiff and I remember being really determined one evening because I, I was watching on the t on the television um rhythmic gymnastics and uh, I saw you know the crazy stuff and I was like right that's it and so <laughs> I got the sofa out and then I just did like out of nowhere I just decided to do over splits and I'd never done over splits in my life. I couldn't barely do the splits. So like you just said, I like tore my hip flexor oh, my. instantly. So I was off for like two months. No. I, I was just like, see, stretching doesn't work for me. <laughs> but then, no, um, yeah, but then you just like, that was stupid. But then you just, I, 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 I think the biggest thing in this conversation is that I can't believe you ever not being flexible. Just, just go for that out there. I'm like, no, it exists. I see you at dance works and her leg and her arabesque is like by your head. And I'm like, wow. Oh, yeah. thanks, Anna. But no, I learned very quickly after that. It was just like slow and steady, very slow and steady. Um, but fast forward a little bit and you were representing England, correct? In um, Australia at 15. Yes. right Commonwealth <laughs> games um yeah. how did that feel and did you how did you cope with the pressure of representing your country on such a large scale yeah it was a a crazy to be honest it was crazy building up to it because I had taken so when I was 14 I stepped out of the sport for nine months and did ballet actually um I might have met you for the first time when I was at that age I don't know yeah, but like I came to dance then. classes yeah yeah so I actually came out of the sport for nine months due to family circumstances um and it was great because I got to get a taste of ballet taste of the profession that I ended up going into hmm. um but then I remember being like the Commonwealth Games next year and I just can't I was like I just don't want to live my life thinking what if like what if I had tried to do it and I could have gone so um I decided to go and just give it a try like let's see what happens I mean the selection for the actual event is like long and hard there's so many trial trial events test events and you compete against the best people in the country so even getting on the team is like felt virtually impossible because I had been out for so long like you just yeah. don't take nine months out of the sport you you just don't when you're trying to qualify for something like this um also because I was going up into the senior level and I was you know young mm. and so I remember when I qualified it was just a big shock so once I got there it was just I'm gonna enjoy every moment because this is my dream at that point that was like my dream I had had for so many years I remember arriving in Australia and I was like I just want to like every competition I've done I've always been so nervous and so stressed and I was like you know this one I just want to enjoy every second of it and then whatever happens happens yeah um and so yeah I mean I was still stressed let's be honest I was still stressed <laughs> but I think being young I was like oh man I've got my whole life ahead of me like let's just enjoy this moment and um I mean it, it's in Australia the other side of the world I mean I, I was and like it was a paid for by Team England so yeah. I was like very happy to be out there um experience the village meet other athletes I think it's one of those life experiences I think I'm going to take with me wherever I go. I even bring it into my, you know, um, yeah. ballet career. Just those experiences that like once in a lifetime. Um, you, did you think of that as um, as your last sort of thing in gymnastics? As I actually, one? I actually carried on afterwards. So um, after that, I came 
second at the British Championships um, and then the number one retired. So then I was like number one in the country for um, a while because I was competing for England and then I started competing for Great Britain. So yeah. then the competition becomes even bigger. Yeah. And so I was, became number one and um, well, I had done the World Championships before that lady retired and then I became number one and I won the English Championships and then that was November 2018. And that's when um, the decision was made. I was going to step out the sport. Um, I think things had got very difficult in terms of the family situations. Um, and I also knew that there was always going to be a ticking clock on right. the ballet world because um, going to vocational school, there's only a small window, really. Um, and that window for me at 16 was closing very rapidly. And there was so much to learn before I would even be ready to step into a vocational school that, you know, so the transition was definitely very difficult. Um, yeah. But yeah, so my last competition was actually English Championships, but um, Amazing. I feel like, yeah, the Commonwealth that Games must... was like my biggest, biggest event. Yeah, well, that's, again, very inspiring. And that must have been um, very difficult, actually, to step away from, especially when you've gained such titles you know over over the course of your gymnastics career um but it sounds like you know you already had this sort of idea of ballet in the back of your mind since you were 14 that you were carrying with you you know and it must have been quite a strong desire if at 16 you said well that you know it's already a ticking time bomb like i need to get into vocational school and start this other dream i have you know yeah i always knew Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what was it that actually sort of inspired that other passion of yours in the first place with ballet? What triggered that? Yeah. So um, I always knew I wanted to have a like I wanted my life to be dedicated to the arts and dance. Dance was always like I always knew when I was with the gymnast that dance was what I was going to go into afterwards. Like it, performing arts, it was going to be that was going to be my, my focus. Hence why when I had an opportunity to step out of the sport for a while, that's what I focused on before I went back. Um, I think it was inspired. My mum used to perform um, at my church. And so I used to be up there since like day dot, like probably I was two years old, waving a flag on the front of stage while watching my mum, you know, dance her heart out. And I think that was a massive inspiration for me in, in the dance world. And then when I did take that kind of nine months before the Commonwealth Games, I did dabble in like lots of different forms of dance and like ballet was the one that I was like I love the discipline like the day in the day out it felt almost like the sport I was doing it yeah was, it was like, similar in some way yeah like the dedication and the discipline and the technique it didn't feel too I quite like structure so I, I liked the fact that it was like structured and there was a a right way to do it and a wrong way but then you could also bring your own individual like mm. spice to it as well so I think that's what really drew me to the to the ballet world. Um, but yeah, for sure, the decision was like not not an easy one. I think it was um, like for sure my mum was one who was like, look, like this is my mum and my parents were very much like, look, you really need to think about your career. You really need to think about the next steps. Like, unfortunately, because rhythmic gymnastics is not funded in this in this country. It, you can only go so far with it and mm. my my dad was um very kindly funding it all for me but he was like you know yeah. what's next for you after this and I feel like that financial stress caused so much uh tension for us as a family so mm -hmm. they're very happy that now I have would a job say, <laughs> would you say it's more expensive than ballet because you could say ballet ballet is another thing that's not exactly paid for you know I think yes or no so with ballet there is opportunity to get scholarships to get funding right. to get grants like for example if you go to a school in the UK yes. that has a degree program you get a grant um there isn't really anything structured like that for rhythmic gymnastics in the UK so you know the trips we were going out abroad um we were paying so much money to go and compete for our country um and I think in the end it was like 
maybe my parents felt they were giving so much and they were like but what is this going to like it's what career is at the end yeah it makes sense like like it so, will finish when you're like 18 anyway yeah and so the then then investing in ballet school is like well this is investing in like the profession that you're hopefully going to go into so I think that's what made it easier for them in terms of financially and also I was very lucky uh, when I went to ballet school that I got a lot of support um in terms of um Elmhurst really supporting me financially so yes um I was very lucky so, in that sense <laughs> Well, that was a big deal um, getting into Elmhurst um, prior to actually reaching that point, because I know that was a very um, big moment for you um, and especially, you know, sort of validating that you're doing the right thing and you're on your journey to getting this dream of yours to become a pro professional ballerina. But I'm very curious to um, hear what the most difficult thing was for you when you first started training in ballet, you know, let's say more regularly and full time, and you had to sort of undo some of the gymnastics training. Tell us a little bit about the struggles and what you found most difficult on, on your journey, basically, to training completely differently. So uh, how long do we have? <laughs> um, it, it, was a, it was a huge struggle, I think. Um, I I didn't underestimate it but my mum certainly underestimated how much work it was going to be to transform me from gymnast to ballet dancer I think the whole I think it was also not just a physical mentality but like a mental thing like to change the way that I approached training to change the way that I thought about movements because before everything had like a point system so it was like yeah. you get 0.5 if you hold your point chip balance on Rilla Bay and then it's like if you do this throw and that many turns and you get that and I was like I couldn't get my head around I was like what is it that gets marks like what is it that I need to do to get into like ballet school is it like do I need to do four turns okay I'll just like practice the way it turns and if I do four does that mean I get into ballet school like I was like confused on what what counted and what didn't um it's really so I think that was it yeah it's really interesting you say that Hannah because I actually think um there are so many dancers out there who think like that now like especially yeah. when they're trying to compete in these competitions i've this is like a huge fear i have of like this is where ballet is leading you know it's mm -hmm. to like because i always think how can you mark a giselle with a key tree like how does that even make sense yeah <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean they're completely but, different yeah yeah so it's really interesting you said that um because i i often think this is how young dancers are actually thinking now just about like what they need to tick um yeah so tell us about how yeah carry on how you discovered the sort of artistic side to yeah it. like i think <laughs> i think i learned the hard way a lot of the time i i remember so many classes and I would just be like doing my like high legs because I'm a gymnast so that's what I do you know like nice high legs but I was really focusing on like okay now I'm not I'm no longer a gymnast like I'm a I'm a dancer and that took me so long to start believing that because mm. my identity had been so wrapped up in the gymnastics that I had always go into this class and because of these experiences I'm about to talk about like I always felt like everyone was looking at me as like the gymnast of the class not a dancer so, so trying to redefine myself was like so difficult yeah um because I would go into class I would lift my leg just above 90 degrees and then I used to have the this happened several times the gymnast uh the teacher would scream at me like no gymnastics in class Hannah what do you think you're doing and I'm like I'm doing literally what the girl next to me is doing but for some reason because I was a gymnast they would be like screaming at me for doing gymnastics in class when I was just lifting my legs slightly over 90 degrees was um, this prior to prior to Elmhurst or yes yeah, yeah prior to Elmhurst so um I think then is when I started to almost I tried to not tell people that I had been a gymnast before um going into classes or anything I tried to almost um like I didn't I know I was proud of the fact that I, what I had done, but the way that people would treat me once they found out was completely mm. different. Yeah. Um, they're like, oh, she's a gymnast. I'm like, no, I'm trying. This is what I'm doing now. Like, yes, I was a gymnast. Yes, I loved gymnastics, but now I'm, dan I'm a ballet dancer. Um, 
I always remember I didn't truly feel like a ballet dancer until I think it was I was still I I got my apprenticeship at Birmingham Ballet and I took a video and I sent it to my mom I was like oh my mom oh my gosh mom I look like a ballet dancer and she's like well like you are one so like it's still what like that was three four years since I had retired and I still was trying to like find that identity back in um as a dancer so I think the biggest thing for me was just socially physically because obviously physically I still had some you know turnout was a huge thing um everything like <laughs> in parallel like walking and I was like oh so everything has to be like that and retraining my brain to think like that was it's still something I'm working on now but um it's definitely getting better no it looks uh, great <laughs> I've seen the so, video <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's it's coming it's coming but there's still there's still have that I'm trying to trying to crack I mean my mm. feet were I've never had those like perfect lines um mm. and in gymnastics they still handled me when I was a gymnast but it wasn't so important as it is in ballet to have those lovely lines because as soon as you put a point shoe on you know you're gonna yeah. instantly look like that so um I think that's you know was that hard that for you life. was that hard for you to undo the you know your feet alignment and things like that I think I think it it was always going to be like it was an issue as a gymnast as I was saying they tried to work it with me as a gymnast but I didn't fully I didn't understand what they were talking about because I would watch you know other gymnasts and they, their feet look a bit like mine and I was like well you know it's okay and then yeah. I would look look at ballet dancers and I was like yeah my feet don't look like that <laughs> and so then I was like oh man I have to do something about this if I want to be successful like yes. this feels like the difference between me and them and then I started understanding the concept of line like before I was like line great let's get the leg whack it up um yeah but I would still I would look at my arabesque and I would look at like a professional's arabesque and I'd be like there's something different and I don't know what it is but there's something yeah. wrong here and so I yeah. think I, I took that away um mm. and what I did so many tondus because just closing into fifth positions was so difficult I didn't have the muscle memory to pull the toes back yeah so I would just be like this all the time so like learning like the simple basics I was learning those at like 16 17 late. I just yeah I was so it was very late obviously I had been aware of them at 14 but it, they hadn't like sunk in until I was like okay this is what we're doing this is crunch time um and again because of the finance I gladly my church was really lovely and they let me um use their studios um they're not like proper flooring but they were like space yeah and they let right. me use them mm -hmm. um and I just used to spend hours and hours and hours just trying like filming myself trying to find the technique and trying to kind of do a bit of guesswork I was like I think that looks a bit like what I I used to do like the pre-classes you know from the yeah. pre-room mm -hmm. and um watch them and I'd be like okay I have to try and replicate that like what looks different to my video and what they're doing like mm -hmm. all that sort of thing which I think actually helped me progress quite well because it really made me self-reflect a lot yes um, so that when I did go into classes like yours at dance works and stuff I had all those things in mind that I could apply to your exercises so yeah <laughs> yeah I think I agree um one thing that made me improve a lot um and improve quickly was um because again sometimes you can't feel things what I was quite good at is watching someone mm -hmm. in like slow motion and then sort of I would almost imagine I had like some superpower where I could like absorb what they did like see it and then do it myself with my own body so I'd like oh. watch a lot of slow motion like on YouTube like of the, all the great ballerinas I was watching a lot of fuetes at one point yeah I was struggling with those so I'd like pause 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 and just look at what their shoulders are doing when they change the position you know and just like literally absorb yeah um, visualization it, is so important like I really think that, that there's a big like I think it's underestimated the power of visualization in, yeah. in the arts and in sport that mm. was I was about to say there's another thing big difference between ballet and gymnastics was picking up exercises <laughs> oh my goodness of course and learning French <laughs> so bad oh my goodness see the French because I had done I had done a bit of ballet classes before 
mm. like I did the grades and the vocational grades like while I was doing gymnastics I was still doing some type of ballet it was just very different like you'd almost do the same thing every day it was always like syllabus work or Russian ballet which is like for us was like no music and just really really slow like really slow yeah. we had a Russian on the squad there was a Russian ballet teacher and it was all like the like yeah yeah forced turnout and which was like it gave me a taste of what ballet should be but it was just so 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 slow and we never made it off the bar but anyway but not, fun. <laughs> yeah, not fun but so strengthening um anyhow I did uh, you know when I came into ballet I just couldn't picking up exercises would terrify me like that was the one thing that would hold me back so much in auditions because I'd just be nervous like what if I can't pick up the combinations and Allegro was the hardest one for me yes and I still struggle with that when I joined the company because in COVID we never got to Allegro really because we were like at home only getting up to first Allegro then we got back and then it was building back up and then we were back at home and then we were just doing first Allegro and then we were back in and then still just trying to build it back up and I never really got that much like priority because we just didn't get the opportunity to yeah and so that when I joined the company I was like what are all these steps I've, I've just never done any of these before I don't know what I'm doing um and then trying to slice them together in my brain I've, you know some people are very naturally apt at putting things together mm-hmm. I'm not one of those people so I have to work <laughs> a little bit harder at it um and so um yeah I still think it's something I'm working on but I found this year like we're already learning new reps for Papilio this year and I can already feel such a difference after a year or two years you know being vocational school and then um apprentice like I can finally feel some of that experience that you're sinking in and I'm like wow this is this is so much easier to pick up now wow life is so much better when you know what you're doing I so, think like yeah. like everything else I think what uh, you have achieved and done is down to a lot of um hard work and vulnerability with yourself and being able to be very honest with yourself and what you need to work on and not being afraid to put in that work because i think you know i've come across a lot of um dancers who are kind of scared to go to a hard class scared to go to an audition scared to actually practice on their own scared to film themselves to actually see what's wrong because they don't actually want to face what's wrong but of course the only way to get better at something is to be completely vulnerable with yourself and work very hard and that's one of the reasons that i definitely wanted to speak with you because the result of what you've done is down to just that like sheer hard work and i remember seeing you when you first were coming to uh, my classes maybe you were 14 and um you know you were just starting but what i have always noticed about you hannah is how you enjoy everything so even when you know you're first starting out and you're obviously struggling with some things and you know the the extensions look too easy (laughs) but i'm you know but like you're like so so ready to absorb any information you can get any critique anything and i think that is the um well one of the most important ingredients for people to understand that's going to lead them to success is just being like so hungry and so have huge desire to get critiqued to be told the mistakes you know and to put in the hard work and you've done that through and through so you should be like unbelievably proud of yourself you know Thank you. It means a lot coming from you because you <laughs> inspired me so much, especially in those like first stages, like when they go to a dance sports class and actually seeing someone like so incredibly capable and like every like you encapsulate like everything like a young dancer wants to be. I was like, oh my goodness! Like so, it gave me something to like want to replicate. Mm. Um, and so yeah, it means a lot coming from you because you have been such an <laughs> <No>. inspiration. <laughs> but I understand because. Um, I it was sort of I got to that point as well just from so much alone time so much practice hard work so um I fully just believe in hard work 100 percent 
Um, but Hannah, going back to you getting into Elmhurst and, you know, you're, you're in Elm, Elmhurst now and, you know, you're training there, obviously, well, how was the routine for you, first of all, like getting through a sort of proper ballet day? Did that sort of feel easier than a gymnastics day or different? It's so different. It's I get this question a lot and I'm like, it's so <laughs> I need to come up with a better answer because there's just so... I can't even explain the difference. I think rhythmic gymnastics, for one, for me, um, I was one of the only, wherever I went, I, I, I competed for a few different clubs in the UK, but wherever I went, I was always one of the only, I'd be the only one of my age or the only individual gymnast, because you do group gymnastics, but I was sometimes the only individual, that I was always kind of a bit more my own. Mm. which is not a bad thing like I, I don't mind like again working hard like I was very focused but I think at ballet school like you have the added element of like loads of people around you all going for the same like two jobs that are available um and so I think that element that social element is well, I was also homeschooled so that social element was also like an extra added like oh, wow i don't realize how much this also fatigues me whereas that before wasn't really part of the the training whereas actually learning how to be with colleagues which is an important part of just life like yeah. it's something I was also learning while I was at ballet school I always remember the first day I had spoken to someone and like oh you know it's gonna be so easy they'll ease you right in like it's gonna be you know you'll do like an hour ballet class because it's the first day back you know we did an eight hour day I, I we came in <laughs> I thought there was like a warm up class. We did a ballet class. We did a ballet bar for like warm up class for an hour, and then we went and did a jazz class for an hour, and then we did a two hour ballet class. Yes, another ballet bar, a whole other ballet class, and then we had lunch, and then we had two hours of contemporary, and then we had two hours of rep on my <laughs> first awesome. day, and I was like, I loved it though. I I remember coming away. I called my mom and the facilities at Elmhurst were amazing and the staff made me feel really welcome because I had come off doing the greatest dance BBC TV show yes and I was so nervous that everyone was gonna because I was the only new pe person joining the graduate year and that everyone was just gonna think of me as like the TV girl and I just I was like I've just come out of being like the freaky gymnast girl I don't now want to be like the freaky TV girl coming in um <laughs> because you got to the, and so you got to the for anyone who doesn't know um Hannah got to the finals right I think semi-finals semi-finals of the greatest dance. a long time ago now yeah semi <laughs> semi-finals of the greatest dance and you were actually going back to your roots a little bit and doing gymnastics then yes yeah yes, so yeah but then you were worried about going to ballet school and being seen as well maybe a gymnast again exactly exactly so I think that first day was definitely a bit nervy um and all I remember of ballet school was just going like a million miles per hour. I knew I had like, again, another kind of ticking clock. It was my graduate year and we're all like trying to get jobs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was like, I really got to make this happen. So I just remember every spare minute I was like trying to get in the studios, trying to work. I mean, point sh for me, ballet school was like a point shoe navigation. I was like, I had done point work. We just came out of the summer lockdown. So couldn't really do much in there. And then suddenly I always remember our ballet teacher at the beginning of the term being like um so we're not going to put point shoes on in class this week but next week we'll put them on in class and I was like wait a minute she's talking about point class right like not not like regular regular class we're not putting the no we were putting point shoes on in regular class and I had never done that like properly before and so I was like so we have to do like point shoes every day for class and that <laughs> was like I had only just kind of got the combinations yes, <laughs> going on flat, on flat. And then suddenly it was like, now you're going to put like these weird things on my feet. And I'm now I'm going to have to try and relearn how to do a ballet class with these clogs. Like, I just remember that being like a whole, I don't I'm still trying to shape my feet. So I wasn't quite happy with how my feet were looking. Mm -hmm. And then I was going to have to try and navigate a ballet class like in them. So I always remember the point work was like my main focus. I knew I needed to increase not even my, well, obviously my technique needed a whole lot of work, but just my confidence in the point shoes. Cause I always was telling myself, I haven't had as much experience as the others. I don't like the feeling of being on point at the moment because it doesn't feel comfortable. It doesn't feel 
mm-hmm. um, doesn't feel right. And then I always remember, like, by the end of my graduate year, I'm like, oh, I hate doing class on flat. I want to do it on point shoes. It just feels like comfortable. So, like, I yeah. think, again, all that hard, all those hours I put in, yeah, um, exactly. really paid off by the end. Um, yeah, when you're not comfortable just... with something, like pirouettes or just point shoes, people will say, you know, how do I get good at something? I'm like, you just got to do a lot of it <laughs> to get Yeah, a lot of practice. Um, um, so how did your um, apprenticeship come up? How did that happen? Yeah, um, that was a bit of a shock to be honest. I was coming close to the end of my graduate year. I think it was in June or something. And there's always this apprenticeship audition. Elmhurst, um, usually um, one person from the year from Elmhurst gets this apprenticeship at the end of their graduate year. But obviously I'd only kind of just joined the year and I was like, you know, I, I really was not expecting um, to be at the level or you know in comparison to others be at the level to get the apprenticeship so I always remember the audition coming around um, I'd already kind of decided what I was going to do I was actually thinking another year of training would actually be really really beneficial so I thought oh maybe I might go and do a training program um, I was thinking of going to the English National Ballet actually and do a training program with them oh, yeah. I got I one, an yeah. offer and I was like you know what well, I had some offers from international companies but I was like because of COVID was still quite rampant I was like I would quite like to stay in the UK because the thought of like going to New York and being in a in a box apartment and then having to be stuck there I was like no I'm gonna focus on UK I also might I love my country so right now that's this is where I want to be and mm-hmm. um, when I made that decision it made my graduate year like a lot clearer I had a lot more like focus of, instead of like throwing my applications out everywhere I had like okay I want to stay in the UK um yeah I, I think a lot of people are like so you don't want a job because <laughs> there was just no jobs in the UK um <laughs> so I was like oh I'll go to a training program get another year jobs will open up something will come up mm-hmm. um and so the, that was kind of my mindset going to the apprenticeship audition um and I just remember going in thinking I had no chance whatsoever and I was like just dance your heart out and just enjoy it I came to the end of the audition we were doing fortes and everything had gone so well and I just had like a really good feeling about it and I was like surely like don't get yourself excited like surely not like you knew this was never going to be yours <laughs> obviously you'd always dreamt of it like you just didn't think that was ever going to be a possibility um and we waited two weeks since the, so the audition happened in two weeks we had to wait to hear who had got it and I always I just remember not sleeping not eating I was just so like what's happened I don't know like I didn't think I have a chance now I feel like I have like a bit of a chance but then I was like going back and forth in my brain and my mum I drove my mum absolutely nuts it was like <laughs> waiting to hear whether I'd co- qualified for the Commonwealth Games again it was a similar situation two weeks waiting for that so yeah. my mum was like oh Hannah this again um anyhow I um I was called into the the principal's office and he turned the computer. He was like, "There's some people who want to talk to you." And they turned the computer screen around, and there was Carlos and Dominic Anthony. Oh my god! Oh, uh, we'd really like to offer you the apprenticeship. And I like, I well, I don't really remember much of that moment. But apparently, <laughs> uh, my the principal said that like I was super professional when they were. I was like, "Thank you so much for this opportunity. I like work really, really hard." And as soon as the Zoom call ended apparently I just burst into tears again I can't remember much because it was just no, I'm sure like you did. A, an emotional moment you know like a real moment of I've made it now you know yeah or I'm on my way I, to I'm me. a ballet dancer finally yeah you're, <laughs> you know you've been taken into a professional company and a really good one you know and then yeah, soon big, after big moment yeah and then soon well you did your apprenticeship and then you actually got offered a contract to stay on as a company member so then that's like a real moment of you know being yeah. a proper professional ballerina having a contract and you must have been yeah. completely over the moon about that I was yeah again my apprenticeship I had so much to learn so on top of all I feel like every season has had like something I have to like learn and up to and because of COVID at school, we didn't get to do a whole lot of quarter ballet work. So then I was thrust into the world of lines and staying in line and being mm-hmm. in time and counts. Yeah. And I was like, as a gymnast, you're on, you're doing a solo. Like you're just <laughs> always doing a solo. So you can do whatever counts you like. And you didn't 
the only lines I had to be in were the, the big lines on the carpet. So that <laughs> was fine for me. Um, and so that was a huge thing to navigate and still something I'm working on. I don't want to say I'm perfect, but maybe you're destined definitely... to be a soloist, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to conquer. I've decided I'm going to conquer the quarter ballet work because then, then you can do anything. So I'm like, I'm, I think the first like few weeks kind of adjusting to company life, we did like Romeo and Juliet, which was quite a lot of like character work, like working with yeah. characters, which I loved. Like that was loved, actually the first, um, first ballet that I started with as well was Romeo oh, and Juliet. It's just it's so such nice. Nice ballet. Oh, I was so Sorry. like, it's my favorite ballet as well. Like Juliet is like my dream role. So getting to watch like my inspirations, like do it yeah. was like. You learn a lot from watching. Yeah. I was like a total ballet bunhead for the first <laughs> few weeks, for sure. Um. <laughs> But I think, yeah, no, the quarter ballet work was, I think I didn't understand that, like, because I always wanted to show myself, I was like, I've got to do everything perfect. I've got to like show off. And it's like, actually the quarter ballet work is all about like fitting in Mm -hmm. so that you look beautiful in the lines. Like you don't necessarily want to stick out too much. Obviously you want to do it technically really well, but it's all about like merging and being full with the company. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a, big learning curve is like no I obviously want to present my best but I have to do whatever looks best as a whole Mm -hmm. um, with all the other members so I think that was something I I very much learned um, over time and before I prioritized like what I used to do at Elmhurst I took away and I was like I'll be in the studios and I'll work on turns and I'll work on this and work on that and then I get to rehearsals and I'm like Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. What line? Where? Oh, you've got oh to learn to pay that yourself. way. Right, exactly. To and pay then yourself. I think the moment for me that shifted things, I think it was halfway through the nutcracker. I was like not finding the quarter ballet work the easiest. And I was like, you know what? I actually have to focus. No, I think it was during Don Q actually. So we done nutcracker. But like I thought it was like, oh man, like I need to my focus should actually now I need to focus on the quarter ballet work this is my job like I think I had the light bulb switch I'm like they don't care if I can do 50 fortes if I can't stay in line then yeah then you know so then I I was like okay I'll prioritize I'll make sure that I have energy for the rehearsals not just my own like training because before I, I felt like I was prioritizing like the training aspect I was like this is going to make me a better dancer this is what it's going to make them want me you know yeah you know what you say to yourself all those sort of things and then I realized no it's like I need to be the best company member I can be and yes there's times where maybe there's a bit more of an off-season less rehearsals where you can work on your technique and that is you being your best company member for your company Mm. but at this current time what your company needs is for you to stay in line and for you to blend in and for you to give energy the right energy on stage with the other company members so I think when that coin dropped, things definitely shifted for me at the company, just in terms of just right. where my focus was at. So um, what would you say? So, what would you say you've learned most, if you could pinpoint one thing about yourself and becoming a professional? Becoming a professional, especially something I'm focusing on this year. So we've all got the different seasons. This year is all about balance because. Um, I think something I'd never learned really before because I I felt like I had to fast track a whole lot of things like even my my education I fast tracked my A-levels fast tracked everything to try and make up for lost time now I'm at a place where like I'm I'm now a professional I'm here I'm I want to invest my life in this company at the moment and um just learning how to balance life and putting importance on happiness I actually was listening to one of your podcasts this summer <laughs> and you you spoke exactly on this subject and I was like this is exactly what I'm going through right now is that you know you've done all this training and you've done everything I felt like I was always in a state of so much fatigue mm-hmm. sometimes that I could never enjoy anything that I had achieved or I had worked for I'd always felt like I had to be in this state of like stress and like it has to be this hard and if I'm not yeah. working that hard then it means that I'm not going to be a good dancer but now I'm realizing you know what you can actually enjoy your life and also be a good dancer like it's possible (laughs) Uh, 
I know like mind blown <laughs> like not that I didn't enjoy my life before but like just I'm stepping into that new sense of like there needs to be a sense of balance because I, I I had a bit of an injury at the end of last season which really brought things into perspective for me mm. um, so over the summer I, I had to take time off which obviously it's good to take time off in the summer anyway because the season is so strenuous um but it was just like yeah I always thought yeah I always thought like you know if I didn't do every single exercise every single day yeah if I didn't do this that this that like all your rituals you know as a ballet dancer then Mm. I'm gonna lose everything and it's all gonna because I'm a very type a type person so Mm. I was just so focused but now realizing that I can include variety in my life and in my lifestyle in my training and I can still achieve the results that I want is like I think a, a big breakthrough in my in my head and so I've always been a person who's it sounds funny because I've been through a lot of change in my life maybe that's why I get a little bit nervous about it but I've, I've been a bit nervous about change yeah. um, but now I'm, I'm realizing that you know that's the only way that you're going to evolve to a next level is is by change so for me currently finding balance I feel like is actually what's going to get me to that next level not let me make me digress so yeah, I think I, I think yeah. actually um that's a really great thing to discover very early on I feel like people don't discover that for ages so you know well done <laughs> and oh, we're still on the journey we're still on yeah the journey. <laughs> I don't think the journey ever ends um but I think you know when you look at successful principal dancers um they aren't people who are like obsessed 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 you know they're people who allow themselves to miss a piti allegro one day if their ankle's hurting or you know they allow themselves to go out on their on their night off for example if Mm -hmm. they have a rest day the next day you know um they allow themselves to have fun um because you need that balance as you say and that relief to have inspiration and motivation to come back again the next day and do it again and again and again because it's your life you know and it's like this shouldn't there's no kind of end point if you don't want it to end and so you should be enjoying it otherwise what's the point you know 100 i think my this the priority i'm now placing on just like being happy in my life is so much higher than it was before um that sounds like so weird I obviously I've always enjoyed dancing um but then when you get something like an injury it really puts things in perspective of like oh my goodness like for a second like when it first happened I was like I can't live without ballet like what do I do with my life like I just felt like what what is there to live for like like, that's sort of like crazy and I was like wow you really need to develop other things in your life so that you just have a bit more sense of balance so that you know things aren't always going to go amazing at work like that's just life like the yeah. when those things don't go great like to have other aspects of life that kind of just hold you up to get you through those tough moments otherwise you will just crumble in those tough moments and then then like you know you're not actually going to achieve where you want to go so actually knowing that it kind of builds you a stronger foundation so that you can like I don't know keep going um because yeah. I feel like that in a ballet company one of the most important things is just to keep going just like and day in day like out you're injured <laughs> oh yeah well, I'm, I'm starting to learn this one <laughs> yeah no you're doing good you're doing good Hannah um what advice would you give a young dancer because a lot of young dancers are gonna listen to this um what advice would you give them um for making it to their dream company oh wow there's there's a lot I always would say like my catchphrase like dream big and make it happen I always remember um I had one teacher who said to me I was it was when I was like working towards trying to get into a company they said to me um uh, you have to be realistic like you know you'll probably make it into a mediocre company if you're lucky and I remember being so crushed that I was like you know what I'm, I'm gonna prove you wrong <laughs> and then obviously later I got I got to join the Royal Valley which is my dream company and so I think not letting another person put a cap on your expectations of yourself because after, after that conversation I was like I just need to bring my expectations from here back back down to earth um but I think 
setting yourself those goals which may seem beyond what you can achieve is actually actually really healthy like it's good to like push you forwards and always have those goals in mind I get so many questions uh, I was at the Elmhurst summer intensive and this came up every single time was um what do you do like when you don't feel motivated to like get up and do a class yeah. like what do you do to like bring yourself that motivation I always remind myself like what is my goal here what is it that I want to achieve um and that helps hone my focus For example quarter ballet work like my goal was like I'd love to be able to stay here I'd love to get that contract and then my focus was like, okay, how do I get that contract? Oh, it's like fixing my lines for quarter ballet work, really focusing on those rehearsals. So the once I focus on that, it helped me achieve that. Yeah. So I think really being clear on your goals. Agreed. Don't underestimate your goals. Like be be bold in, in what you want to achieve. Yes. But then also see the building blocks that you need to go through to get there. Um, and be very like every day wake up with that purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um and that's something I, I've always found helpful for myself. And that just motivates me right through. <laughs> yeah, I say goals are hugely important. And like you say, always dream big. You know, I used to, like I say, dream of like, I'd always see myself performing some principal role. But then it's it's then, okay, so you have that big goal, that big dream. And then like you say, it's the building blocks towards that. So what what action are you going to take every day that like mm -hmm. takes you one step closer towards that picture you have in your mind? Yeah. But if mm -hmm. you don't have that picture, you know, and you wake up and you're like, oh, I think, yeah, I, I guess I can do my feet exercises today. Like, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not propelling you further and further each day. Literally. I would like, I do a lot of journaling in the morning. And so like I set like, even every week sometimes it's a day thing it's like what do I want to achieve today exactly um, yeah. and like it doesn't even need to be ballet related sometimes I'm like for example I have a free weekend this weekend and I'm thinking I want to enjoy my weekend so that's my goal I just want to have a good time like yeah. enjoy spend time with family and that's my goal is just to enjoy um yeah. and then like for example next week I'm kind of building back up my technique from the summer and so my goal will be to pick up the rep for the coming season and then once that, that all hones into like perspective then everything around my day is structured around those kind of goals which is I find just makes my my approach to my work so much clearer otherwise yeah. I feel like you can be doing just a load of like stuff that you don't actually need to do which yeah. I was culprit for <laughs> and then you burn yeah. yourself out and then you burn yourself out and get injured and then you can't do anything so yeah clarity <laughs> clarity of goals is yeah very important but I think everybody should um, listen to that because you've achieved a lot in two different fields so goals <laughs> think about your goals is very good everybody Hannah's achieved it <laughs> but Hannah um thank you so much I think we'll have to end it there today but honestly I could speak to you for another hour seriously about lots of different things um but no it's been very um interesting and inspiring to hear your story and also for me personally because obviously I know you from a while ago um but it's very nice for me to hear your history and what you did early on and how far you've come and I'm sure you're going to go further and further yeah in this company and in future companies if you decide to go elsewhere and I look forward to chatting with you again later on in your career <laughs> when more has happened um so thank you so much hannah and we'll speak to you again soon thank you so much for having me it's been an absolute pleasure well, guys how inspiring was that to hear from hannah it kind of makes things very clear how hard work and dedication really really pays off the hours on your own but more importantly knowing what your goals are knowing how important those goals need to be and also knowing what they are when you wake up in the morning, being very clear and having that clarity of what those goals are. Dream big, like Hannah says. Don't limit yourself. Think about that big dream you have and then think about those building blocks that get you closer each time. That's what I want you to take away today. So thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you for everyone for watching. Bye for now.